So we'll start with violet, and we'll work our way to shorter wavelengths and shorter frequencies. The next region of the spectrum with slightly shorter wavelengths is called ultraviolet light. Then comes uh, shorter wavelengths, which are X-ray light. And this overlaps somewhat with another region called gamma ray light. We'll talk more about that later. Um, you've probably heard about all these before. And one thing I think you probably know about them is they're all associated with danger. There's something about these that makes us want to avoid these. Um, they can cause anything from sunburns to cancer. Um, but let's talk about why that is, and uh, we'll look at some common aspects of these uh, types of light. So we're seeing that things that have uh, short wavelengths and high frequencies have more ability to cause damage than things that have long wavelengths and low frequencies. But that shouldn't make any sense because you know, the ability to damage something is usually related to energy. And we've seen that with waves, energy is typically associated with amplitude, not with wavelength or frequency. So there must be something else going on here that ties uh, frequency into energy as well as just amplitude. So just to be clear here, you can broadcast a certain amount of energy per second or power with any wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you know there's radio stations that can reach across hundreds of miles. They must be very powerful compared to those little FM transmitters that don't broadcast over a distance much wider than your car. So you can transmit different amounts of energy with any frequency in the electromagnetic spectrum each second. That said though, nobody ever got a sunburn from a radio wave. So there must be something different about how light with um, short wavelengths, high frequencies, uh, light beyond the violet here, um, interacts with materials. That's what we have to look at now. So this inability to explain why materials interacted differently with different kinds of light led Albert Einstein in 1905 to propose a new model for light, that light could be seen as a particle and that each particle slams into material and delivers a certain amount of energy. Building on earlier work by Max Planck, he said that this equation shows how much energy a particle of light, also called a photon, can deliver. E equals HF. In other words, the higher the frequency of the light, the more energy it carries. H is just a constant, so essentially we're saying that when you increase the frequency, the photon gets more energy. And this gives us a reason why high frequency light behaves differently than low frequency light. Particles of violet light deliver more energy when they collide with material than particles of red light do. Particles of ultraviolet or x-ray deliver lots more energy than a particle of, say, radio or microwave. So if we think about every particle of light hitting matter as delivering a certain amount of energy, some particles may deliver enough energy to a molecule to cause chemical reactions. Other particles won't. This starts to give us an understanding of why light behaves differently with different frequencies. So the interesting transition happens between when you have a frequency of light whose photons have a low enough energy that they can't knock electrons out of an atom, to when you get to a frequency of light whose photons have a high enough energy that they can do that or ionize the atom. This type of radiation is now called ionizing radiation. And the reason it's dangerous is if you ionize an atom, it suddenly becomes chemically reactive. And this could break bonds, it can kill cells, it can cause sunburns, and if you're unlucky enough, it can even start to contribute to cancer. So this is a big important distinction between photons that have this ability and photons that don't. We call this ionizing radiation for that reason. There's not as clear a dividing line between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation as I have drawn here, because every atom is different. So there is some visible light that will ionize some atoms. There is some ultraviolet light that won't ionize other atoms. Um, so don't think that this is a, a hard and fast line. But the key thing to understand is generally the higher the frequency, the more energy a photon has, and the more likely that particular radiation is to be ionizing.
And that's why we have to be careful with higher frequency photons. That's why we worry about ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays. So I'm sure you've been taught from the time you were a little kid to avoid ultraviolet light. There's obviously a lot that comes from the sun. We uh, cover up uh, if we have to go outside. We wear suntan lotion in places we can't cover up. And generally we know that this causes uh, skin damage and skin cancer. We avoid things like tanning beds for the same reason. Um, but not all ionizing radiation is bad if you use it in controlled circumstances. An example of a positive use of the ionizing properties of ultraviolet can be found in this goggles cabinet. This is set to be tightly sealable so no light can get out. And we know that students wearing goggles that other students have worn is kind of gross and a good way to spread bacteria and germs. So if you put the goggles in a cabinet like this, turn on ultraviolet light for a while, eventually enough chemical reactions will have occurred to kill the bacteria and make the goggles safe for the next student to use. So ionizing radiation, if we're trying to cause the ionizations, can be a positive thing. And that's one good use of ultraviolet light. Of all the types of ionizing radiation I listed, the one you're probably most familiar with are x-rays. We use these all the time in medicine and in security to see what's inside an opaque object. But that probably should give you pause now knowing that this is ionizing radiation. Because in theory, x-rays could ionize an atom, break a bond, even cause cancer. So why do we expose people to ionizing radiation um, for a purpose like that? The answer is relative risk. There's a risk of being exposed to ionizing radiation but there's also a risk of getting on an airplane if somebody has a bomb, or walking around with a broken bone, or not knowing you have tuberculosis. So at the end of the day, we have to make a judgment call of what is the worst risk. So this x-ray is of my wonderful cat Scout uh, back when she ate a ribbon. And that can be actually really dangerous to cats and dogs because it can lead to intestinal blockage and rupture, which could be fatal. So when we talk about risk, the risk of not knowing what was going on in her body was worse than taking an x-ray. This was a concerning one. These dark spots in her intestines show air pockets. And she passed the ribbon okay, but they were a little worried when they saw this. So the job of a radiologist is basically to determine when an x-ray is warranted. X-rays typically don't have a huge amount of risk to them, but we don't take x-rays for no reason. We take them for very specific reasons so that uh, other hazardous conditions can be ruled out. X-rays like this one are relatively low doses, but there's an obvious limitation to them. This is essentially just a two-dimensional shadow of all the internal structure of my cat. It's all flattened onto one uh, flat image. So there's not a lot of information about what's going on three-dimensionally inside. If we needed that information, which would be important for treating some diseases, um, there's another kind of X-ray called a CT scan which involves much higher doses of radiation, but it gives 3D uh, images of what's going on inside. Um, this can really help with certain problems. That being said, doctors and patients have to be much more careful in considering the risks of it, or how many to do. This is a sample of a radioactive isotope called cobalt-60, and it's a source of gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is another type of electromagnetic radiation, with very high frequencies and short wavelengths. It's a lot like x-rays and the two overlap. The distinction really is where do they come from? X-rays are usually generated by electrons moving around in atoms and gamma rays usually come from the nucleus. But it's another type of ionizing radiation and one that uh, we have to be careful around. This is one of the reasons we're, we're wary of radioactive materials. There's other kinds of ionizing radiation that come out of radioactive materials that are not electromagnetic radiation but that's a topic for a different lesson. So I'm acutely aware that for half this video I talked about the wave properties of light, like frequency and wavelength, and then I started talking about how different particles of light carry uh, different amounts of energy. So which is it? Is light a wave or a particle? The answer is it's really both. Um, this is one of those strange things that happens when you try to talk about things that are so tiny atomic size or smaller, um, the models we use in our everyday world sort of break down. So light's not really either a particle or a wave, but there's some things about it that we can understand best by thinking of it as a wave, 
There's other things about it we can understand best by thinking of it as a particle. So this uncomfortable duality happens a lot in chemistry and physics, and it's worth getting used to it. Remember, it's all just models, and the value of models are their explanatory power. Both the particle model and the wave model tell us some things about light. So I hope after this grand tour of the electromagnetic spectrum, you understand that the difference between radio waves all the way through visible light, all the way down to gamma rays, is wavelength and frequency. We can use the wave model to understand that. I hope you also understand that how much energy each particle of light carries is based solely on the frequency, and that explains to us why some colors of light can be more damaging than other colors of light. If you understand those things, you have a good understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum.